Okay, we're now in open session. Can I welcome everybody to this week's meeting? In the room with me today, I have Andy Allen. On Starleaf, I have Alex Easton, Sinead Ennis, the Vice Chair Kelly Armstrong, Robin Newton, and Karen Mullen. So you are all very welcome. I'll then move straight on to agenda item one, which is apologies. Do we have any apologies to record? No, none at this stage. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'll move on to agenda item two, which is draft minutes. Um, members, you'll find the draft minutes of the 29th of April 2021 at page six of your meeting pack. Can I ask members, are you content with the minutes as drafted? Content? Yeah, okay. Um, content. Good, thank you. Um, I'll move on to agenda item three, which is chairperson's business. Um, members, the, the Mayor of Antrim and Newton Abbey Borough Council, um, Jim Montgomery, Montgomery recently wrote to me to highlight that the Council had considered correspondence from the Carnegie Trust UK regarding the Embedding Wellbeing in Northern Ireland project. The Mayor wished to express that the Council fully supported the summary recommendations, particularly the regeneration responsibility and funding should move to local government, and hoped that the Committee would support the recommendations of the Carne Carnegie Trust in this regard. I know I certainly had a, 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 a meeting with some of my colleagues um, with Carnegie Trust. I don't know, have members met with them at all um, to, to hear what, their, uh, what they were, their proposals were? I know all of the councils will have met with them if you've been speaking to your council colleagues. Um, just any comments on that? Would we like to get a, a written briefing from them? Yes, yes please. Okay, well, we can do that in the first instance. Or do we already have that, John? Yeah, they've been invited to uh, a stakeholder meeting, a uh, proposed stakeholder meeting in the future. So, okay. Um, okay, sorry. That's one, sorry. Of the, that's one of the informal stakeholder events. Yeah. Apologies. I've just been, sorry, I've just been told that, just been informed. They have been invited to one of our informal stakeholder events, so we're happy to leave it at that for the time being. Yep, and, and thank um, uh, the, the Mayor of Antrim and Newton Abbey for setting that through to us and their, their support for, for this also. Um, members, we're then going to do the formal clause by clause consideration of the licence bill later in the meeting. I will just take this opportunity to remind you of the issues that I raised last week in Starleaf. It's important, um, members, that uh, I, that, that you know that even if your camera is on, or actually not even, I know Mark's camera isn't on, if you're seen to be in the audience or in the, you know, of the meeting, you're deemed as being present here. Um, I know that emergencies come up from time to time, have to take a phone call or something happens. Um, if, so if members do feel they need to drop out at any time of, this, of the meeting when we are doing the clause by clause, can they please notify one of the, the clerks immediately? Um, and then we can we can pause the meeting for five or ten minutes if need be to allow for for any emergency that might come up. But I'm just letting you know that while you're seen to be part of this meeting, you're seen to be part of the decision making on it as well. So it's just putting that out there to you. All right. <laughs> okay, members. Uh, thank um, you, Chair. Sorry, Chair. On yeah. that, I'm going to have to nap out for maybe half an hour from five to twelve till twenty five past twelve. Okay, Mark. Well, we'll see where we are in proceedings then. Um, if 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 Janice and Sean can kind of alert me at that time, because I'll not be looking at it. And if we do need to go on to another part of business within our, you know, maybe the the correspondence or something else within our pack, we can do that. I think it's important that all all members and certainly all parties are represented when we're doing the clause by clause. So if somebody can remind me of that, or even Mark, if you can remind me as we're going along that you need to leave. And um, we can see where we are and either pause or move on to something else. Is that okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, no. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm then going to ask you to move to agenda item four, which yeah. is matters arising. Members, we've been provided at page 24 with a reply from National Museums <coughs> NI in relation to the relocation of the Model Engineer Society. Um, they wish to reassure the committee that it remains committed to regular engagement with uh, the Model Engineer Society to discuss its relocation and look at all relevant options. It remains its intention to support the relocation within the remit of its organisation and subject to that value for money tests and necessary approvals. The removal of the train apparatus can be included in the budget for site clearance. This will form part of the business case referred to in previous correspondence. Um, members, are there any comments on that? Are content to note that response? Kelly, go ahead. I was just going to say, can we forward this on to um, the model 
engineers um, just to ensure that they're aware of what the I have a lot of feedback. Um, if they, they're aware of what um, national museums are also saying, um, I think that there still isn't any offer of financial support to help them to move off um, the site at this moment. Um, so it would be good to ensure that they are aware of what the, the museum sent us. Yeah, I'm that's content with that. Members content with that proposal, yes? Yeah. Okay, members happy enough we move on? Um, I think that's that's set up for matters. No, All right, not no, no, no. Top of I'm on the wrong five. page, as usual. Um, also, members, um, you've been provided at page 25 for the reply from the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government in relation to the UK Shared Prosperity Fund. Um, the reply states that the UK uh, Shared Prosperity Fund will launch in 2022 with a target, will, and will target people and places most in need across the United Kingdom. Um, so along with uh, the levelling up fund, the UK Shared Prosperity Fund will create a package of UK government support which invests in skills, infrastructure and innovation at local, regional national level to help, uh, to help local areas prepare for the introduction of the fund. The UK government is providing an additional £220 million through the UK Community Renewal Fund. The aim of that fund is to support people and communities to pilot programmes um, and new approaches. Uh, the, government, the, the UK government will run a national competition against a fixed national allocation in Northern Ireland, equating to £11 million of funding, and um, project applicants will submit bids directly to the UK government for assessment and approval, and where appropriate, the government will seek advice from the Northern Ireland Executive on shortlisting projects. Members, um, any comments on that? Are content to note? Sure. To go ahead, Sinead. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, it's just I'm a wee bit just scant on the details, maybe, of it. Um, 11 million doesn't seem like a, a wild pile of money um, for the, for this region. So, you know, I'm sure there'll be plenty of competing projects. I know in my own uh, council area, we have um, the Newry City Park earmarked, um, which could probably gobble up the whole of that 11 million it's, uh, on its own. So, um, it's just, I mean, how, you know, if, if, there's, if there's a project there, it's just the things um, we're missing step in terms of applying directly to the British government. Um, so, I mean, what, in terms of like, you know, surely councils will have a role in this. Um, so, basically, my point is, I'd just like some more information um, and to, to get a better understanding of the type of projects that could be eligible for this. I mean, is it capital? Is it resource? Um, I would just like a bit more information, really. Um, as I say, we have projects here just in our own, if I'm being parochial, in our own uh, council area that would, would gobble the, the most of that 11 million up. So it doesn't seem like an awful lot of money. Um, so, yeah, just, you know, are councils involved in this? Um, and and if so, how? Um, if, if we can get some more information on it, I'd, I'd be appreciative. No, I think they're all good points, Sinead. We could certainly uh, try and do that, Kelly. Uh, thanks, Chair. And I want to say uh, um, I agree completely with what Sinead has put forward. I'm extremely concerned about this move. Um, the UK Community Renewal Fund seems to be a preparation in advance of what the UK Shared Prepared Prosperity Fund will be. Um, if we took a comparator of the organisations that are currently being funded by European monies um, compared to what whatever the intentions are of this UK Renewal Fund, I have a, a, a fear that many of the organisations that have kept society running through COVID are not going to be able to apply. Um, so I think we do, as a committee, need to be pushing back to the executive to ask, well, for to the UK government, first of all, to ask them for clarification on what the intentions are behind the renewal fund and the shared prosperity fund, but also um, to write back to our minister to say that we have concerns that there are a number of community and voluntary organisations that have depended on European money. Uh, that European money, when it is removed, it is supposed to be replaced by the UK shared prosperity fund. And we have a huge investment here from that European funding into supporting people, for instance, um, and many of our community activities. Um, and we're extremely concerned. Like 11 million, as Sinead has said, is it's a huge amount of money, but it's a drop in the park of the amount of money that our community organisations use to support um, ground-up approaches here. Um, 
and it just concerns me greatly. I think we do need a lot more detail um, and ask our minister for an update on, on what discussions she has had or the department has had, any concerns that they have that we can certainly support her with. That would all be very useful. Well, we can certainly do that and also the Minister for Finance as well because it will be coming through. Um, um, I think all of those proposals I would agree with um, from Sinead and Kelly. Members, any comments further on that? Are they happy and content to agree those proposals that have been put forward? Agreed? Agreed. Okay, thank you. Um, members, I'm going to then move on to page 27 of your pack, where you'll see our departmental response in relation to the discretionary support scheme. Um, a policy and operational delivery review of the scheme is underway and will consider views from an independently chaired panel with expertise in the area. Updates will be provided to the committee on the progress of the review and findings of the panel over the coming months. Again, members, any comments? Are they content to note that, Kelly? Just very simply, could we find out who's on the independently chaired panel? Um, it just would be interesting to see if some of our very um, expert or independent organisations from the community and voluntary sector are included in that. Okay, certainly can do that. Members, any other comments? Or agree with the proposal and happy to move mm -hmm. on? Just, just, just one wee thing, Chair. I thought now when we were writing, and I can't remember the text of the, the letter we sent, that we'd added in something around support for people having to self-isolate or doing a particular self-isolation grant or, 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 or support and that doesn't seem to be referred to in, in the response. I know previously when the Minister had said about this review, I thought she'd given maybe May or June as the date to have it completed. So the coming months, we don't know how many how many months that might be. We just want to know if, if we could maybe go back on the self-isolation thing at this uh, critical time when businesses are reopening, uh, people are going back to work, and uh, y you know there is still risk. It hasn't gone away. No, uh, we, we'll go and look at the letter that we sent first and foremost, Mark. Just double check that that was included in it. If it wasn't included in it, we can certainly make sure that uh, the follow-up is sent. And I think you're right. I think coming months doesn't give us any great indication of a time frame there, so we maybe need to firm well not maybe we do need to firm that up as well. Um, any other comments members wish to make on that or are we content with those proposals? Content? Yeah? Can he hear you? Yep. Thank yep. you. Thank you, Fra. Okay. okay. Members well, can, can I ask you then to turn to page twenty eight where you'll see a departmental response in relation to the Caravans Act 2011. Um, there, I, I want to just read this so we have it on the record. That the response outlines that the current legislative responsibilities. Um, so I think it would be useful um, because there have been queries. We've all had queries in recent weeks and months. So parts one and three of the act relate to the residential sector and are the responsibility of the Department for Communities. And part two of the act relates to the holiday sector and is the responsibility for the Department for the Economy. Um, to make the, the position more complex, the 1963 Caravan Act, which is the responsibility for the Department for Infrastructure, um, makes provision for the licensing and control of caravan sites. Um, the licensing system under the 1963 Act is then administered by councils who are responsible for issuing and enforcement of licences. Moving on, uh, the review of the Act, the response states that the 2011 Act places an obligation on DFC to review parts one and two of the schedule within five years of the Act coming into operation and at least once in a period of five years thereafter. Um, review action took place during 2016 and is due to be instigated once again. A review action will take account of evidence collated since 2016 and include findings from the Department for Economy on the holiday sector and correspondence with interested parties such as MLAs, the Caravan and Camping Forum for Northern Ireland, National Caravan Council, site owners, res residents, etc. 
Councils will also be asked to report on any referrals, court actions and any prosecutions around illegal eviction or harassment. Any resulting findings which relate to the holiday sector will be referred to the Department for the Economy and any issues relating to the 1963 Caravans Act will be referred to the Department for Infrastructure. Once the Department is in the position to commence the review, there will be an opportunity for further input from interested parties. Um, I know that was all a bit long-winded, and it is, it is actually quite complicated when you see that there are three uh, departments that are involved um, with, within the, 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 the caravanning issues. But members, I just wanted to, to put it out there for the record of whose responsibility is who and also um, around the reviews. And actually, it was actually good to, to see that, that this was an act that did have a review clause or did have a review put in it. So, and it has been done, um, which is, is something that we've been looking at, I suppose, in the licensing bill. So, members, any comments um, on any of that? Are you content to note and forward a copy of the response to the original correspondent that wrote to us about it? Kelly? You're on silent. Sorry, I think that's going to be the bane of my life for the rest of my life. You're on mute, Kelly. Um, I was going to say it might be worthwhile because, as you have said, Chair, this is it actually spells it out quite clearly, clearly where the responsibility for the Caravans Act lies. Um, should we maybe share this letter with um, our colleagues on the Committee for Economy and um, who's the other one? Infrastructure. Infrastructure. Yeah, I don't think that's a bad idea. I think it would be good to maybe do that so when everybody um, understands their, their roles and responsibilities there. Any other comments, members? No, are we content then with that proposal and we'll move on? Yes? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, members, can I get you to turn to page 30 where you'll see a reply from the Commissioner for Older People in relation to post office card accounts. Um, the Commissioner raised concerns in 2017 with the Post Office and Department of Communities about the decision to close these accounts. He highlights that banks have also been closing branches, with more banking functions only being available on online, and yet many older people have a strong preference for branch banking. He remains concerned um, that the imminent closure of post office card accounts may lead to an increase in financial exclusion amongst older people and lead to many getting relatives or friends to withdraw large amounts of cash for them um, and then also keeping that cash within their own within the home as well. Um, as the government has already taken the decision that the contract will end in November 2021, he states that it is vital that the support um, that the, the vital that the Department of Communities now provides additional support information and active awareness raising for individuals older customer, and older customers to advise them on how to make the changes and details of any payment exemption services that might be available to them. Um, the Commissioner has not received any requests for assistance to date from <coughs> older people in relation to this issue. However, he will keep this under review and continue to provide advice as required. Um, members, any comments on that are content to note that response? Kelly? <sighs> Thank you, Chair. It is something that I am concerned about. Um, I have certainly received communications from older people um, in my constituency. Um, to be honest, we're down to one or two banks located in larger towns. Um, the problem is that whenever an older person, in particular a person who's aged maybe 80 or 85 plus, is asked to set up a bank account, they're asked for information that they uh, and identification that's very difficult to get because, as we all know, um, the electoral... Um, offices that used to be located in, in our local towns have all been centralised, so you can't go and get photographic ID easily unless you have a driving licence, passport. You can't. It's not easy now to get an electoral um, identity card. So there's a lot of older people extremely concerned that the requirements of banking, and we know it's there because of fraud and, and money laundering, but the requirements are the same for an 85-year-old as they are for a 25-year-old, and it's very difficult for those people to get that ID, um, it is something I think we should keep in contact with Eddie with. Um, I would like to know if the department has been engaging um, further with Eddie about uh, about the sorry the older persons commissioner um, about this issue. Um, while he says that he's aware of it, and I'm sure he probably is speaking to the department, uh, we're not seeing what uh, you know sort of what his input has been to the rollout of the marketing. Um, if the marketing is all done online, it misses the whole point um, that a lot of these older people 
don't use online. In fact, I was speaking to an 86-year-old last night um, who just wanted to catch up and find out what was going on in, in Northern Ireland politics because she doesn't do online. And um, she's very concerned about things like this because her nearest bank would be 25 miles away. She has no local post office. It has been closed down for, and now, albeit temporarily. Um, there's no credit union where she lives. So how is she supposed to get her money Um even if it is paid through a bank account, um, there's one hole in the wall machine that's that's not working most of the time. So these are the concerns that older people have. Um, I'm just wondering if we could ask maybe for further clarification um, from the department on who they're engaging with to ensure that their marketing strategy for this is going to actually reach out to those people. Okay, Callie, that's a fair point. Um, any other members, anything they want to add to this? Yeah, Chair, we had sought a bit more detail on that payment exception service, haven't we? We are still awaiting that from the department. Uh, just bear with me. I'm looking we'll at. Double, double check. We'll double check on that, Mark. So we yeah. will double check. I think we had because because I, I remember that says anyone who's unable to set up a bank account will be moved on to this payment exception mm -hmm. uh, service. But I think we'd go back and ask, what, what do you mean by unable? Mm -hmm. Could it be just someone who hadn't, yeah, <laughs> hadn't I, bothered? I, I, I'm not suggesting that there would be those people, but how do they establish who is unable? And if that's the case, that whoever's unable is going to be moved over, then why are they harassing and haranguing uh, vulnerable people, telling them they have to switch accounts? Yeah, I remember that terminology. I remember you bringing that up. Um, so yeah, I think, that was very big, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I remember you saying that. Um, look, we'll double check on that, Mark, as well. So we will um, and uh, see if we uh, need to action that further, if that wasn't responded to in full. Um, are, are members content then with those proposals um, around yeah. that issue? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. can we move on? Um, then can I ask you to turn to page 32 of your packs where you'll see a departmental response in relation to the job start scheme. Um, this is in response to our letter asking for information as to where the job start opportunities will be across Northern Ireland and highlighting that the department needs to be proactive in promoting the scheme across all areas. Um, the response states that the job start scene is open to all employers of all sizes across all sectors and from all areas of Northern Ireland. And by the 16th of April 2021, applications for funding had been received for employers offering job opportunities in each of the 11 council areas. The department expects the first young people um, to have started their job opportunities by early June of this year. And extensive engagement events have taken place with organisations to inform them about the job start scheme. And examples of activities undertaken and planned are listed in the letter. Um, members, any comment they wish to make on that? Are they content with that response, Kelly? Um, no, I'm grateful that the department has has confirmed that all eleven councils have um, you know applications coming in, and I know it's early days on this. But when we look at page two of the letter that we've received, I think it's page thirty three. I'm absolutely astounded that. The engagement and communication has not included um, career services or schools. Um, we have a wealth of young people, another year of young people just about to leave school, um, who need these opportunities, but we're not actually telling them. We're leaving it up to youth organisations. And, you know, I, I know that they're probably reaching out to a lot more businesses at the moment, but um, we have to tell the young people about this as well, given the fact that youth organisations are only just coming back. Um, and starting to come back now, um, you know, I think there's a missed opportunity there. We should be informing all those career service people. There will be a number of young people who are now going to be signing on um, once they finish school because they don't have anything else. Um, I would like to see what engagement has been done with all the work coaches to ensure that they're aware of the opportunities in the area, especially the businesses that have applied um, to encourage those young people to go forward for those opportunities. Thanks, Kelly. Karen, did you want to come in? Yeah, Chair, just like Kelly, I suppose, um, uh, you know, youth organisations and that only cover uh, a certain cohort of young people. I would have many more questions. So I was wondering, are we getting a briefing from officials on this, Chair? Hold it, bear with me one moment. As soon as we finalise the report on, yeah, on the bill, we will be doing a work planning session to 
arrange briefings. Okay, Karen, um, just be advised there, as soon as we finish the bill, which is next week, then we'll be doing a, a, a forward work plan, so that can certainly be added to it. Um, I, think it's, I think it is good that we do get them come in to give us an update. We had them in several times before it started, um, questioning them um, as to why it wasn't being done. So I think it would be good to get the, a more positive, you know, and that positive news as to what they are doing. So yeah, Great. I'm happy with that. Um, anybody else want to make a comment on it? Yeah, Chair, can I, Chair, can I raise that? Yes, a, certainly. A, um, I, I think I have a question into the Minister already, and I have to say the Department uh, department has a vast experience uh, of, of running these type of programs and uh, the, over, over many years. The one area that does give me cause for concern at this point, and I do think we need uh, some clarity, the young person undertaking the training, whichever uh, employer he or she is with, needs the incentive of working towards not just a job, and hopefully a job, but indeed in the absence of a job uh, at the end of the programme, that indeed he or she leaves with a qualification that is uh, transportable on to hopefully securing a, a job for them. I'd like to know, Chair, which qualifications, if any, that the department are uh, seeking to implement uh, and at what level they, they will be aiming uh, I think this this program has is going to attract young young people who will only want maybe level one qualifications, but it also has the ability to attract attract young people who want two, three, or four level qualifications. Yeah, look, thank you, Robin. I know you actually highlighted that um, a week or two ago that very issue, and I'm being told here by the committee clerk um, that we have written to the department about that issue. We wrote to them, I think, maybe last week or the week before on that issue. So we're waiting on the response on that. Um, so whenever we get that response, um, depending on on how detailed or not detailed the response is, um, then we'll pick it up from there. If you're happy with that. Okay, Chair, thank you. Thank you, Robin. Okay, members, any other questions? Um, are we happy that um, we accept the proposals that were made there and move on? Yes? Okay, thank you. Great. All right, members, we're going to then move on to agenda item five, which is our deliberations on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. Um, members, for this part of it, we're going in briefly into closed sessions. So can I ask... Um, a broadcasting to bring in Claire McCanny before we do that, please. There we go, we've got Claire in, so members, we're just going briefly now into closed session. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. Okay, members, we're back into open session again, and we're going to move on then to agenda item six, which is formal clause by clause consideration of the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. Um, just before we uh, start, members, I want to draw your attention to a reply from the Minister for Justice to queries on the accessibility of liquor licensing data held by the courts. 
The Minister for Justice confirms that each clerk of Petty Sessions maintains a licensing register, which are made available for inspection and information uh, from them is supplied to DFC when requested. Um, if members are content to note and to include a copy of this reply in, their committee, in our committee report. Content? Content. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, members, before we uh, commence the formal cause by clause consideration, we have to consider the text of the Minister's remaining amendments that will be taken forward by the Minister. Some of these will be new clauses in the Bill. So can I then welcome to the meeting um, Carol Reid and Liam Quinn. I see Carol's there. Is Liam with us yet? Can we bring Carol into the spotlight, please? Somebody's typing away. I can hear them. Um, Carol, are you there? Morning, Chair. Yes, Liam's probably halfway up the stairs. Okay. <laughs> so he'll be coming to us out of breath then? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> he should be here shortly. Apologies. There's not a problem. Um, so there's not. Uh, we'll just wait then on, on Liam joining us before we move on. So we will. Member Carol, just... you just remind us uh, what page we're on um, on the pack so okay. before we get into it. Absolutely. Bear with me one moment. Um, that would have been the Minister's responses, yeah. which is, remind me where that is, Janice. Yeah. No, well, we won't, whenever you're reading out the clauses, that's not in the pack because we're just then being green the clauses. Do you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> so there's not a full copy of that. You have the full copy of that. Me. Where's the response from the minister? From the minister on that? Oh, sorry, that's in. That's what we're looking for. Sorry, in the pack, right? Okay, that is on page. Bear with us, folks. Still waiting on Liam arriving. Six. Thirty-six. Minister's response is on page thirty-six of the. Page thirty-six, Sinead. Okay. Cheers. Okay, and we will go through them one by one. Um, so we will. Sorry, the um, the amendments from the department are in that we're going to look at. Sorry, is that what you're asking yes. for? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's in the tabled papers. Table pack. Okay. John, isn't that right? The department's response is in the tabled papers. So we need to check that um, Kelly can see that. Okay. Okay, which page of the table papers are we looking at? Getting to the top of mine. Right, where's Liam? Um, what I, like what I, I'm going to do here is we're just going to take a, a, a brief moment offline. And can I ask you, uh, Carl, if you can try and make contact with Liam for us, and everybody just stay where they are in the spotlight. I'm just going to go off mic for a, mi a minute. 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. All right, we're back in open session again. Um, members, you will recall that last week's meeting we agreed the text of the first set of departmental amendments we requested for clauses 4, 11, 12, 27, 28, 29 and a new clause 24A. The remaining amendments and new clauses are in your tabled papers. We will go through in the order that they are dealt with in the department's letter. So then, can I ask you that we'll look first at new clause 1A which provides for the amendment on the removal of restrictions on late night opening on Sunday for licensed premises. Can I then ask on 1A, are members uh, content with that amendment? Content, yes, thank you. Okay, I'll then move on to new clause 23A, which provides for the removal of restrictions um, on late night opening on Sunday for clubs. Um, again, can I ask members, are you content with this amendment? Agreed. Content, good yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. Then we'll go to new clause 22A, which provides for the amendment on alterations to registered clubs. Again, can I ask, are members content with that amendment? Content? Mm -hmm. Okay. I, if I don't hear anybody say no, I'm moving on. So if you're not content, <laughs> please speak up. Um, then can I move on to amendment to clause 29, young people prohibited from bars. This is the amendment to provide regulatory making power to amend the months referred to in 29.1 and the number of prize giving ceremonies referred to in 29.2. Again, members, are you content with that amendment? Content? Great, Great thank you. Then new clause 32A provides the amendment for the department to produce guidance. Again, can I ask members, are you content with that amendment? Content? Okay. Okay. Then I move on to new clause 32B, which provides for the amendment for the department to carry out reviews. Again, can I ask, are you content with that amendment? Content? Yeah. Okay. Amendment to Schedule 1 on Day 1 membership. This is the amendment to clarify the policy in respect of the registration of clubs NI Order 1996 that allows a member of the public to pay a fee that allows them to use the facilities if a sporting, for, of a sporting club for a day and to ensure this is not allowed, allowed or not to use, sure this is not used to allow someone to simply use the bar facilities. Um, again, are members content with that amendment? Content. Content. Thank you. Then, um, just inform members that the committee will now commence the formal clause by clause consideration of the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill with Liam and Carol from the department and Claire McCanny from the bill office has also joined us for this meeting. So. Um, I will read out the title of the clause before asking the formal question on the clause. Members, if you have any final queries for Liam or Carol, please alert me at that stage before I read out the formal question of the clause on whether the committee is content with each clause as drafted or as amended. So, members, clear with that? Yes? Okay. Can I just ask if we could ask Starleaf to um, do something with your microphone? Because to be honest, it's up and down. We can barely, well, I can barely hear you. Okay. Um, I haven't been getting the same feedback that I was earlier, albeit um, there, there is a little, but it's not too bad. Can I just, just advise members that through this clause by clause, I need to hear people say yes, or I need to see a show of hands. Um, so. We will we will we'll try it for the first couple of clauses, and if Kelly, you are getting feedback or you're finding it difficult to hear, um, 
I, w I will then put all me members, uh, ask them to mute and use their hands up function. Um, it's not feedback, Chair. I'm sorry, it's your microphone is, is dipping in and out of sound. My microphone? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Broadcasting have said it's people not muting microphones is causing an issue with yours. Okay. Right. Well, then what I will do then is does, it, does everybody know or everybody should know how to use the hands up function on their um, screen? Because I can't see everybody. I mean, all right, what I can do is, Mark, I'll ask you to use the hands up function um, on the screen. All of, all of the other members, I can see them so I can. Um, other than Fra doesn't appear to be on the screen at the moment, but um, it's on the big screen. It's on the big screen. That's okay. It's just on my small screen. Right. Can everybody please put themselves on to silent and that way that will stop any feedback and we'll give it a go from there. We'll take it slowly. And, and we'll do, we'll yeah. just, yeah, we can take our time on this. So everybody now on silent? Yes? Okay. Right, so what I have to do then, I'll just read that out again. Um, Liam and Carol are here for any final queries that members might have, but what I will say to you that you need to alert me if you do have a query before I actually read that the committee is content um, as we go along with each clause. So um, we'll take our time. We'll try the first one and we'll see how we get on. So I'm going to go straight then to clause one, which is the removal of additional restrictions at Easter and ask the committee, is it content with clause one as drafted? So can I see a show of hands? Okay. Content, content, Mark, yeah, people have put their hands up. Okay, um, then I will read and indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause one yeah. as drafted. Chair, can I, uh, some, some of you does give me a problem, but I understand that it's the mind of the committee. Okay, I, I understand that, Robin. Thanks for, for highlighting that. Um, we can uh, reflect that, so we can. Uh, what Robin has said, that he understands it's the mind of the committee, but uh, for him it, it, it would still be, he would have a problem with it, but he understands it's the mind of the committee. Okay. Do I need to read that again, folks? Are, you, are clerks, are you happy with that? The, com the committee yeah. is content. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then we'll move on to new clause 1A, removal of restrictions on, open, on late opening for on sales on Sundays. And so I'll ask the committee... Is the committee content with new clause 1A as drafted? Can I see a show of hands, please? Okay, everybody has indicated to me. Okay, and that they are content. So then I'll indicate for the record that the committee is content with 1A as drafted by the department. Okay, members, we're happy to move on to our next clause. We'll move on then to clause 2. Public houses and hotels, further additional hours. Can I then ask the committee, are they content with clause two as drafted by the department? Please, can I see a show of hands? I can't see everybody's hand. Please keep them up a moment. Just, yep. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll then uh, the committee has supported this, so I'll indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause two as drafted by the department. Okay, then members are happy to move on to clause three, which is alignment of closing time for liquor and entertainment. And can I ask then again, is the committee content with clause three as drafted? Can I see a show of hands, please? Okay, the committee is content. Then I'll indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause three as drafted. Members, we will then, with your permission, we'll move on to clause four, which is police authorizations for additional hours. Can I ask the committee, are you content with clause four as amended by the department? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I then read for the record that the committee is content with clause four as amended by the department. We'll then move on members to clause five, extension of drinking uptime. 
And can I ask, is the committee content with Clause 5 as drafted? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, thank you. Um, then I will indicate for the record that the committee is content with Clause 5 as drafted by the Department. We'll move on then to Clause 6, which is major events. Can I then ask, is the committee content with Clause 6 as drafted? Show of hands. Okay, thank you. Then I'll read and indicate for the record that the committee is content with Clause 6 as drafted. I'll move on then to Clause 7, Licensed Racetracks, Sunday Sales, and ask, is the committee content with Clause 7 as drafted? Show of hands, please. Okay, thank you. I will then indicate for the record that the committee is content with Clause 7 as drafted. We move on then to Clause 8, Licence of Off Sales, and ask the committee, is the committee content with Clause 8 as amended by the committee? Can I see a show of hands? Clause 8 as amended. Okay, thank you. Um, then I will indicate for the record that the committee is content with Clause 8 as amended by the Bill Office for the committee. I'll move on then to new clause 8A tap rooms. And can I ask then, is the committee content with Clause 8A as drafted for the committee by the Bill Office? Can I see a show of hands of those uh, in favour? Can't see everybody. This is the problem. Read out names for okay, I'm going to have to actually read this one out. So I am. So I'm going to go to members just as I see them on my screen on um, clause eight a tap rooms. I'm going to go to uh, first of all in the room to Andy. Can I ask, are you uh, in favour of the uh, clause eight a as drafted by the committee or for the committee by the bill office? Intent, sure. Intent. I'll then go to, um, order on my screen just then to Alex Eason. Alex, are you content? Your hands up. So could, can you come in and just say? I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay, thank you. Can you go on to mute again, please? Um, then I'm going to bring in next in line is Sinead Innes. Sinead, can I ask for you, are you content? No, Chair. Thank you, Sinead. Then I'm going to go to Kelly Armstrong. Kelly, are you content? I have reservations, but I'm content to proceed. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Um, I'm then going to go to Robin Newton. Robin, are you content? I understand it's likely to be the mind of the committee, Chair, so I'm content. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, I'm then going to move on to Karen. Karen Mullen, are you content? No, Chair. Uh, same position as last week, supportive of the, the Minister's position. Okay, thank you very much, Karen. I'm going to then move on to Mark Durkin. Mark, are you content? Yeah, uh, just, Chair, could I just uh, rec record an interest as well? Uh, like Kelly, I have some reservations. There might be different reservations, right enough, but I do think that uh, amendment reflects the committee's difficulty and deliberations on this particular issue, so content, yeah. Thank you very much, Mark. And then, finally, I'll go to Fra. Fra, can I ask, are you content? Can't hear you, Fra. Same position as last week, no. Okay, thank you very much, Fra. Okay, members, and also then to myself as well, <laughs> forget myself, I am content um, with Clause 8A as drafted um, for the committee by the Bill Office. So, therefore, the majority of the committee is content um, with uh, this amendment, um, albeit will be reflected uh, within our committee report also and, within, and also whenever I could up to speak on it in the chamber as well. So, I'm just going to then... Um, put the question, is the, uh, the committee is content with 8A, Clause 8A as drafted by the committee? Okay, members, we'll move on to clause, new Clause 8B, tap rooms. 
Is the con committee content with clause 8B as drafted for the committee by the Bill Office? Um, so, uh, remember we discussed this earlier in closed session. So, again, I will go round members and ask them again about clause 8B. Um, so, I'll start again. Actually, I'll start at the bottom this time. I'll start with Andy, first of all. Andy, are you content with clause 8B? Content, sure. Content. Fra, are you content with clause 8B? That's a no sure. Thank you, Fra. Um, Mark, are you Mark Durkin? Are you content with clause eight B? Sorry, I don't mean to leave you hanging in suspense there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Mark. I'll then go to Karen Mullen. Karen, are you content with clause eight B? No, chair. Thank you very much, Karen. I'll then go to Robin Newton. Robin, are you content with clause eight B? Robin? Sorry, Chair, I was, uh, same position that I understand it is the mind of the committee to, to approve. Okay, thank you, Robin. Um, then I'll go to Kelly Armstrong. Kelly, are you content with Clause 8B? Yes. Thank you very much, Kelly. Then I'll go to Sinead. Sinead Ennis, are you content with Clause 8B? Chair, can you just remind me again the gist of Clause 8B? Just really quickly. Yeah. That's the occasional. Yeah, that's the occasional license part. So it is. No. Okay, no chair. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll then move on to Alex Eason. Alex, are you content with clause eight B? Yes, thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, members. Um, then, uh, as there was a majority support, or sorry, I keep forgetting about myself. Um, I am content with clause 8B. Um, as there's majority support within the committee, I'll then read for the record that the committee is content with clause 8B as drafted. Um, sorry, 8B, yeah. By the, uh, drafted by the committee. Okay, thank you, members. Clerks, can I just check you're happy enough for me to move on as well? Yes? Yeah. Okay. All right, members, we're moving on to Clause 9, which is requirement for off-licence. Can I ask the committee, are you content with Clause 9 as drafted? A show of hands will suffice unless there's a dissension. Can I see a show of hands, please? And see yours, Andy. Okay. Okay, thank you. Then I'll indicate for the record that the committee is content with Clause 9 as drafted. Move on to clause 10, removal of requirement for children's certificate, etc. Can I ask the committee, are you content with clause 10 as drafted? Show of hands, please. Okay. I then can indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause 10 as drafted. Clause 11, underage functions. Again, can I ask the committee, are you content with Clause 11 as amended by the department? And show of hands, please. Yes, okay, thank you. Then I can indicate for the record that the committee is content with Clause 11 as amended by the department. Moving on to Clause 12, private functions. Can I ask the committee, are you content with Clause 12 as amended by the department? Show of hands. Okay, thank you very much. Then I can indicate for the record that the committee is content with Clause 12 as amended. Okay, members, we're going to move on to Clause 13, delivery of intoxicating liquor to young persons. Can I ask then the committee, are you content with Clause 13 as drafted? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, thank you. Then I can indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause 13 as drafted. Moving on to clause 14, restaurants and guest houses, notice displaying license conditions. Can I ask the committee, are you content with clause 14 as drafted? Show of hands. Okay, then I can indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause 14 as drafted. We'll move on to clause 15, prohibition on self-service and sales by vending machines. And ask the committee, are you content with clause 15 as drafted? Show of hands, please. Okay, thank you. 
then I can indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause 15 as drafted. Moving on then to clause 16, restrictions on off sales, drinks, promotions in supermarkets, etc. And can I ask, is the committee content with clause 16 as drafted? Can I see your hands? Okay, thank you. I can then indicate for the record the committee is content with clause 16 as drafted. Moving on then to clause 17, prohibition of loyalty schemes. Can I ask the committee, are you content with clause 17 as drafted? Show of hands. Okay, I can indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause 17 as drafted. New clause 17A, minimum unit pricing. Can I ask the committee, are you content with clause 17A as drafted for the committee by the Bill Office? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, thank you very much, everyone. I then can indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause 17A as drafted. Clause 18, occasional licences, conditions. Can I ask, is the committee content with clause 18 as drafted? Show of hands. Okay, thank you. Then I can indicate for the record that the committee is content with Clause 18 as drafted. Clause 19, Code of Practice. Again, can I ask the committee, are you content with Clause 19 as drafted? Show of hands. Okay, thank you. Um, I then can indicate for the record that the committee is content with Clause 19 as drafted. Clause 20, Board Body Corporate, Change of Directors. Can I ask the committee, are you content with clause 20 as drafted? Show of hands. Okay, thank you. I then can indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause 20 as drafted. Clause 21, the removal of exemption for Angostura bidders. Can I ask the committee, are you content with clause 21 as drafted? Show of hands. Okay, thank you. I can then indicate for the record that the committee is content with Clause 21 as drafted. Clause 22, Sporting Clubs. Can I ask the committee, are you content with Clause 22 as drafted? Show of hands again. Okay, thank you very much. I can then indicate for the record that the committee is content with Clause 22 as drafted. Clause 22A, Consent required for alterations to premises. And can I ask the committee, are you content with clause 22A as drafted? Show of hands. Okay, great, thank you. I'll then indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause 22A as drafted. Clause 23, removal of additional restrictions at Easter. And ask, is the committee content with clause 23 as drafted? Show of hands, please. Okay, thank you. Um, then I'll indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause 23 as drafted. New clause 23A, removal of restrictions on late opening on a Sunday. Can I ask the committee, are you content with clause 23A as drafted? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, thank you very much, members. Um, then I will indicate for the record that the committee is content with Clause 23A as drafted. Clause 24, extension to drinking uptime. Can I ask, is the com committee content with Clause 24 as drafted? Show of hands. Okay, thank you. I can then indicate for the record that the committee is content with Clause 24 as drafted. New Clause 24A, increased authorisations for special occasions in clubs from 85 to 104. Can I ask the committee, are you content with Clause 24A as drafted? Show of hands, please. Okay, I can indicate for the record that the committee is content with Clause 24A as drafted. Clause 25, major events. Is the committee content with clause 25 as drafted? Show of hands, please. Okay, 
I can then uh, indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause 25 as drafted. Clause 26, removal of requirement for children's certificate, etc. And ask the committee, is the committee content with clause 26 as drafted? Show of hands. Okay, thank you. I can then indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause 26 as drafted. Clause 27, underage functions. Is the committee content with clause 27 as amended by the department? Show of hands. Okay, thank you. I can then indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause 27 as amended by the department. Clause 28, private functions. Is the committee content with clause 28 as amended by the department? I see a show of hands. Okay, thank you. I can then indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause 28 as amended by the department. Moving on then to clause 29, young people prohibited from bars. And I ask, is the committee content with clause 29 as amended by the department? Show of hands, please. Okay, thank you. I can then indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause 29 as amended by the department. Clause 30, prohibition on self-service and supply by vending machines. Can I ask, is the committee content with clause 30 as drafted? Show of hands. Okay, thank you. I can then indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause 30 as drafted. Clause 31, restrictions relating to advertisements. Can I ask, is the committee content with clause 31 as drafted? Show of hands. Thank you. I can indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause 31 as drafted. Clause 32, codes of practice. Can I ask, is the committee content with clause 32 as drafted? Show of hands. Okay, thank you. I can then indicate for the record that this committee is content with clause 32 as drafted. New clause 32A, guidance. Is the, is the committee content with clause 32A as drafted? Show of hands, please. Okay, I can then indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause 32A as drafted. New Clause 32B, Review. Is the Committee content with Clause 32B as drafted? Show of hands. Okay. I can then indicate for the record that the Committee is content with 32B as drafted. Moving on then to Clause 30, 33, Interpretation. Can I then ask, is the Committee content with Clause 33 as drafted? Show of hands, please. Okay, thank you. I can then indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause 33 as drafted. Clause 34, minor and consequential amendments. Can I ask, is the committee content with clause 34 as drafted? I see your hands. Okay, thank you. Um, I can then indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause 34 as drafted. Moving on then to clause 35, repeals. Is the committee content with clause 35 as drafted? You see your hands? Okay, thank you. I can indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause 35 as drafted. Moving on to then clause 36, commencement and short title. Is the committee content with clause 36 as drafted? Show of hands. Okay, thank you. I can then indicate for the record that the committee is content with clause 36 as drafted. Schedule 1, minor and consequential amendments. Can I ask the committee, is the committee content with schedule 1 as amended? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, then I can indicate for the record that the committee is content with schedule 1 as amended. Schedule 2, repeals. Is the committee content with Schedule 2 as drafted? Show of hands. Okay, thank you. I can indicate for the record that the committee is content with Schedule 2 as drafted. Moving on then to long title. 
can I ask, is the committee content with the long title of the bill? Show of hands. Okay, thank you. Um, I can then indicate for the record that the committee is content with the long title as drafted. Members, that concludes the committee's formal clause by clause consideration on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. Um, can I thank um, departmental officials, Liam and Carol, for all of their support, their patience uh, in answering all of our queries, and also um, very much thank you to Claire McCanney from the Assembly Bill Office for her support um, and producing the proposed uh, committee amendments. So thank you very much, members. Thank you, Liam. Madam uh, Chair, Chair, can I? Yes, certainly, Robin. So, sorry, Chair, I, I did try to get on on the uh, Clause 23 uh, the additional restrictions at Easter, oh, if you would record the same position for me. Yeah, okay. I, yeah, I, I wondered why you didn't come in at that stage, because it was the... I thought uh, you would have... Uh, sure, sure. <laughs> All right, okay, Robin, like, thank you. Uh, we'll we'll thank indicate you. that. Thank you. Okay, members, so again, just a big thank you to um, Liam, Carol and Claire for your... your your patience, your time, your understanding, and I'm sure it did require some patience in many moments um, with us a lot through that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think it was a, a privilege to work with you on this particular bill, and uh, the detailed scrutiny by the committee just shows the benefit of the committee stage. Thank you very much for that, Liam. Thank you. Okay, members, um, we're going to then move on to, actually before I do that, can I then ask Broadcasting to move the members then now into the audience again? Please, there we are. Okay, so we're going to then move on to item agenda number seven, which is departmental briefing on the Charity Commission. Um, members, the paper for this agenda item is in your tabled pa papers, so then can I ask I don't know if they're here. Are they here? Bear with me one moment. Um, Sharon Russell and Martin Ireland. They're not actually with us in the room yet, so they aren't. So um, what time is it? It's just a little bit ahead of ourselves. That's yeah, we are. We are a little bit ahead of ourselves. Remember, what members? What I'll do at this stage is we will just take a, a short break while we get to. Get, we could do cars for correspond. Well, we could go on to correspond. Yeah. Quite right. Can I just quickly declare an interest in respect to this uh, item of business as a charity trustee? Yeah, absolutely. Look, okay, members, what we'll do in, then we'll, we'll go on we'll go on to correspondence, so we will, which is agenda item eight, um, while we try and contact um, Sharon Martin. Um, I do understand we are slightly ahead of ourselves today. So again, thank you, broadcasting. You know exactly what we're doing, and they're bringing everybody in the spotlight. So thank you, broadcasting. Um, so agenda item eight is correspondence. Just to remind all members you are in the spotlight again. Um, I want uh, you'll find the correspondence memo at page eighty four of your packs. Can I draw your attention to page eighty nine, which is departmental letter on the consultation on a new strategy for sport and physical activity. The consultation has been extended until May 14th to allow some extra time for further engagement and for a response to the consultation to be submitted. Um, so are members content with that, are uh, content that we note that? Content. Okay. Then I want to ask the members, have anything else that they want to bring up um, under correspondence or are they content with the correspondence memo as drafted? I see your hand up, Kelly. Apologies, Chair. Yes, um, I was just uh, it's of interest in the introduction of Scotland's child disability payment. While I agree with the correspondence that has come forward, there, it does mean that there's amendments to legislation that are relevant here. It would be interesting to find out um, exactly what Scotland um, have taken forward. Um, I know that our own minister is considering um, welfare mitigation um, review. Um, it would be interesting for us as a committee just to see exactly how Scotland are bringing um, forward their changes. Um, it's a very interesting piece and it's something I think we should just be aware of in advance of, of the Minister's review. Okay, thank you for highlighting that, Kelly. Um, any other member, any issue they want to bring under correspondence? No. Okay, members, are you content then that we move on from that? Yeah? Okay, then I'll move on to agenda item nine, which is forward work programme. Um, 
Members, we have meeting space booked for Tuesday the 11th of May at 9.15 um, to solely consider the draft committee report on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. Um, this will allow for any changes to be made that need to be made before um, we uh, uh, on meet again on next Thursday um, to I suppose rubber stamp the, the committee report. So, members, are you happy enough then that we pencil in then a meeting for Tuesday for that? Yeah, yeah. It'll, it'll be before um, before plenary starts, and it shouldn't be a long meeting. You know, it should be fairly straightforward. Okay, happy enough with that. Um, then on the 13th of May, um, we will also receive a departmental briefing on the COVID-19 Charities Fund. Um, so that would be something that I'm sure we'll all look forward to that as well. Um, then can I move to agenda item 10, which is any other business? Can I ask members if they any other business that they want to discuss? No? Okay. Um, then we'll move on. Oh, there's a second. See, Sharon has joined us. Um, I'll move on to agenda item 11, which is date, time and location of our next meeting. So that is just to advise members that the date of the next meeting will take place on Tuesday, the 11th of May at 9.15 a.m., and that will be in room 30. Um, though if everybody is up here on Tuesday, because it is a plenary day, some of you, can you please just let the, make the clerks aware, because not all of you will be able to be in the room. Um, we really can't have too many. You'll have to come in from your from your offices here in Parliament Building. Um, so, uh, and uh, those that are present, it will be in room 29. Um, or no, not be, it'll be in room 30, because 29 is used for... Uh, for plenary. So it is a start off on that. Okay, we now have with us, um, yeah, we do. We have Sharon and we have Martin. Um, these are both very welcome here in the meeting today. Um, can then I ask you to go ahead and um, brief members? Thank you very much, Chair. Can I be heard? You can indeed, Sharon. Go ahead. Just checking. Thank you very much, and thank you for taking us early. We thought maybe that was a possibility, so we joined a wee bit early. Thank you. Um, Chair, we're really grateful to the committee for giving us the time to come, back, come to you today on the back of the paper um, that you received from us back in February, because we know your, your timetable uh, is very challenging at the minute. So we want to make best possible use of your time. And so during the briefing, you, you've received, hopefully, in the last few days, a briefing paper from us. I will try to draw out the key pieces of information we think the committee needs um, and might want to open up discussion on afterwards. Um, so I will do that as an opening statement covering three areas. The developments we have in respect of a proposed assembly bill, a charities bill that would address the impacts of the court judgments. Um, a little bit, but not too much, on the terms of reference for the Minister's independent review of charity regulation. And that will be because that panel is coming to see you in a few weeks' time. So I, I, I don't want to do their piece for them. Um, and then also, importantly, to outline for you some work the Department has been doing around getting some assurances around the effective operation of, of the Commission itself and the lessons learned for the Commission and for us as a Department. So um, if, if it would be useful, I, I was going to just go back to the regulatory framework for members' benefit and draw out you know, what it is in Northern Ireland at the minute. So um, as you'll have seen from your paper, the Charities Act of 2008, we call it the 2008 Act, introduced a regulatory framework for charities here to ensure really public confidence and to provide assurance about charitable giving for people in Northern Ireland. The Act itself created the Charity Commission as the statutory regulator for charities here. It charged it with creating and maintaining a register of charities, and it did provide the Commission with considerable powers to act for the protection of charities. So two very early statutory inquiries by the Commission led to the disqualification and ultimately removal of a number of charity trustees. Those parties brought challenges to the, the Charity Tribunal and ultimately to the High Court. You will be aware from the paper that the Attorney General at the time intervened on the basis of his interpretation of the legislation itself, where he felt it was flawed um, and there was no power of delegation to staff. That litigation 
together with the intervention of the attorney, the attorney general led to the McBride judgment of 2019. And it's really significant that that judgment, obviously, that the 2008 Act, when taken together with Section 19 of the Interpretation Act for Northern Ireland, which the department had relied on with the 2008 Act, does not provide express or implied power to the Commission to delegate its functions to staff acting alone. So essentially that judgment found that decisions could only be taken by the board acting collectively or, or by a committee established by the board for such purposes under Schedule 1 of the Act. And the Court of Appeal decision in February of 2020 dismissed the appeal and found and upheld the McBride judgment. So that's just a presse of the regulatory framework. So that judgment and the Court of Appeal decision then rendered all orders and decisions made by staff of the Commission unlawful. That includes the charity register itself. And in turn, that removed the legal requirement then for accounting and reporting to the Commission um, by those charities. So the effect of this then is essentially, if you think about what the regulatory framework is about, the loss of transparency and accountability provided for the frame, from the framework. So, and, and just to assure members, um, as I know some of you have raised these issues with, with me and with other officials before, obviously on the back of that judgment, um, there was concern in, in the sector. So, so communication from the Commission itself and from the Northern Ireland Council for Voluntary Action, you'll know them as NICFA, have encouraged charities to continue reporting on a voluntary basis. And, you know, at least 63% of charities are doing that. And also that communication assured charities that they are still charities legally. The act of registration doesn't make you a charity. And I, I know that you've been given clarity on that uh, before, but it's just important to be aware that registration isn't what makes a charity legal. And there is no, because of the actions of the commission on the back of the judgment and ourselves writing to funders and HMRC, we're not aware of any financial loss to charities, but there is still confusion and concern out there in terms of decisions that they have benefited from. So I'll not say an awful lot about the detail of impacts of some of the discussion and some of your questions might go into the impacts, other than, in, in, in not numbers, I, I mean, other than to tell you that from it took on its powers in 2013, to uh, up until May 2019, the Commission had registered about 6,500 charities. And I, again, I think I, I gave you these figures last time I was at committee. They had opened 15 statutory inquiries, and there was over 220 odd orders and directions. So, so, so the impacts are um, considerable. Um, so Looking at what those impacts meant for the department then, essentially the impact of the judgment, three things, the judgment's impact on past decisions taken by staff being unlawful and the potential harm, perceived harm and actual harm to those charities needs to be remedied. Then how the Charity Commission discharges its decision making functions. Obviously it's costing a lot more money now because the, the decisions are taken by a statutory com a committee under Schedule 1. Um, so how the Charity Commission exercises its functions in a cost-effective way. And also, I suppose the judgments gave rise to questions around the entire regulatory framework in Northern Ireland, the role of the regulator and the Commission within it, and its relationship with stakeholders. Essentially, we're talking about proportionality, and does the framework and the Commission itself um, has it struck the right balance between supporting charities to do the right thing and deterring or dealing with misconduct? And that balance for Minister Hargey is really, really important. So taking into account then um, the judgments and issues raised by a number of parties affected by those judgments, and they were affected, that's why they, they obviously, um, uh, some of the parties who took, took the litigation, um, Minister Hargey, having, having listened, and she did do a listening exercise with quite a number um, of, of interested um, parties, um, and grassroots organisations, NICFA, the Commission itself, others. Um, the Minister commissioned an independent review of charity regulation and the role of the Commission within it. 
She sought and secured the agreement of the executive to bring forward a bill in this assembly mandate, so she is hoping to bring it through in this mandate, to resolve the issues raised by the judgments in order to protect charities, but also really important, and I will come back to this because the minister would expect us to really make sure that the committee hears this. She wants to rectify, um, obviously, the, the flaws in, in the legislation, but the minister could not be clearer. She wishes to protect charities, but also to protect the rights and restore the basic pillars of the regulatory framework. So, so she's a rights-focused minister, and there, are, there is a risk of cutting across people's rights that she will not take, and just to assure you about that. Um, the minister also noted an internal review of correspondence, and I know committee has received correspondence as well, but um, the, 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 the minister noted an internal review of how the department itself had handled um, correspondence in relation to a statutory inquiry one, into one charity, and um, the department has sought very strong assurances from the chief commissioner of the charity commission on those, and I'll come back to that. Okay, so the independent review of charity regulation, um, it began on the 25th of January. I think the committee will be pleased to know the very first piece of correspondence that that um, independent panel put out was to the committee because before it engaged, it's a very inclusive um, approach, I have to say, the panel is taking, um, but it felt important that the first, the first invitation um, uh, would go to the committee, and I know that because of your timetable, you haven't been able to see them until end May when they're scheduled, and they'll have, I suppose, a lot more to tell you now that they've they've had an awful lot of engagement sessions in the meantime. So essentially, that that independent review commissioned by the minister will focus on learning from past experience in order to inform future development, but it also is about balance and proportionality, and the role of the regulator within that framework. So again. I'll not go into the detail of it. They're desperate to get in front of you so that they can update you themselves. Uh, the, the panel is chaired by a Dublin academic uh, with a legal background. Um, great experience in charity law and comparative studies across a number of jurisdictions. Her name's Dr Una Breen, and she's supported by a number of um, people that you will, the, the committee will know from, from their long uh, records of public service, Reverend Dr. Leslie Carroll and Noel Lavery, a former permanent secretary in Northern Ireland. So um, I, I, that's all I'll say, but ha more than happy um, to, to, to pick up in discussion later if, you, if the committee wants to know some more about that. So just to tell you a little bit about the bill, and obviously, <laughs> you know, you will have a, a, a very clear role um, once after the bill is introduced, but... Um, Essentially, there's been a lot of work on how, how we would address um, the judgments through a bill. So what, what is proposed in it at the minute is um, it's going to be you know, a relatively small bill, um, three, maybe four, but probably three cl clauses. The first one to make lawful those decisions taken by commission staff. But I mentioned the minister's focus on human rights and rights. Um, in making lawful those decisions, the bill will seek very robust and clear provisions to protect the rights of individuals under the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, and, and that's a really important consideration. It will not cut across people's rights who have not been happy with previous decisions of the Commission. Therefore, it will not make those decisions lawful. We're talking about very uncontroversial registration decisions in the main. We, the bill will seek to provide for a future limited power of delegation to staff in some circumstances. So a limited power of delegation in some circumstances. Um, and that will be set out in a scheme of delegation, which the minister would approve and agree. And the third one then would be in response to a number of strong representations from people in the charity sector, the Minister has been asked to consider, and she is keen to include a power to introduce at a future stage a registration threshold, and that would be at some future point through subordinate legislation, because this bill we would not have the time or the evidence, frankly, um, to know where to set that threshold. 
below which charities would not have to register. And we wouldn't have time in this mandate for this bill to go through if we took the time to work out what the unintended consequences of that might be. So the independent review is also asking um, for views around a registration threshold. And again, I know some members of this committee have raised that issue. So um, final drafting of the bill, Martin's on the call with me. Martin's the expert and he's very close to the detail on this. And he's been working with um, our solicitors and with OLC to, to draft the bill. It's nearly ready to um, go to the executive and then to be introduced. We, we would love to see it um, uh, introduced um, and second stage completed by summer recess. But maybe we're being really optimistic, but we, we, you know, the minister's very keen that she gives some comfort and clarity to the sector. And, um, you know, that, that's our aspiration. So only three or four clauses, but it would, you know, small bill, but with really important um, consequences um, to bring comfort and clarity back to um, a sector which is maybe a wee bit confused about where it stands at the minute. Um, so I, I don't know whether you need me in your paper to go into the detail of all of the, the clauses. I might just, because I think I've said a wee good, a good bit as I've gone along there on the clauses, they're in your paper, happy to pick them up in discussion. I just don't want to speak for too long without obviously uh, you, you, you having your discussion. So I'll, I'll skip through those sections of the paper and talk a wee bit just about um, the assurances sought by the department. Committee is aware, and, and some of you have written to us yourselves um, on, on behalf of um, affected parties or just for yourselves in terms of your own comfort, about um, issues that have been raised around the Commission's actions in relation to those statutory inquiries that led to the, um, that led to the litigation. And there have been a number of issues about the Commission's handling of those, but also the Department's handling. Um, of correspondence around those and the department's role even in the regulatory framework and in holding the commission to account. So the department did have, uh, separate from Martin and myself who are now in these roles in, in, in working with the commission and in a policy role, so very separate to us, the, the independent governance lead in the um, department undertook a review. That review led to her seeking um, a, a number of assurances from the Commission. And the com Chief Commissioner of the Commission has herself instructed independent counsel to undertake a review into the handling of the Dis Disabled Police Officers Association charity and the Lochney Rescue Charity. Again, your paper gives you a wee sense of what the terms of reference of those reviews are, but just important to let you know that they will not look at the substance of previous decisions, this is really genuinely more about how, how the Commission exercised those powers, what processes were in place, what lessons have been learned, and a lot of this is about lessons learned so that we can correct any uh, imbalance as, as we go forward. Uh, the Department looks forward to that review being completed and to uh, deciding then what action, if any, the Department needs to take once those assurances have been forthcoming from the Chief Commissioner. So just to flag to you, that's distinct from the minister's wider regulatory review that the independent panel is undertaking, but both those things coming together will be really useful evidence for the minister to decide on what comes next. So suppose, in conclusion, um, Chair, these judgments, obviously, and some of the other adverse publicity and concerns raised in respect of the Commission and the Department, um, uh, after all, the Commission was operating with flawed legislation and the Department is responsible for the legislation and the regulatory framework. Um, so the Minister wishes to address these issues as soon as she can, making sure not to cut across anybody's rights um, and to bring, I think, to restore really public confidence through the bill, the independent review, the assurance sought from the Commission Minister Hargey wants to provide a strong and visible assurance to the charity sector. She's a community activist herself, and she's very wedded, obviously, to, to, to that, to fix that situation for them that's not of their own making and that they believe might cause them detriment. And she has obviously, uh, through the Commission and herself, taken steps to mitigate any detriment in the meantime. And importantly, she wants to restore confidence in the department 
and in the operation of the Commission in terms of the regulatory framework. Openness and transparency are key for her. And I think if I was to sum it up in one word for the Minister, it's about proportionality. Um, and she's keen that we learn the lessons from all of this. So um, I hope that wasn't too... I'm, I'm from Derry and I, I do talk fast, but I, I, I wanted to get through that paper so that um, we would open up um, the, the discussion chair. And we would agreed that Martin's very close to the drafting of all of this, so um, we've agreed that Martin will lead on the questions, if, that's, if that suits, and I will support. Okay, Sharon, look, thank you. Thank you for a, a, a detailed paper and also a detailed um, oral session there as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think I, I love your optimism um, at looking at the end before summer recess for the committee to get uh, <laughs> this done and dusted. Um, mm -hmm. I know the committee are certainly looking forward to getting this in front of them. Mm -hmm. we, we have been mm -hmm. um, talking about this issue mm -hmm. for what seems like an awfully long time. You know yourself, we've mm -hmm. been contacted by many people mm -hmm. who have felt, mm -hmm. you know, that that, uh, that this process had let them down greatly, mm -hmm. had let them down. And, you know, it, it's just, I mean, my question was around the, I mean, we know you'd, the impact this has had on the department. Mm -hmm. We know the impact this has had on charities. And it is that learning experience. And it is, mm -hmm. it's the reputational damage that this has done as well. So it has. Yeah. Um, you know, can do you see that that that, that can be clawed back? Um, because people were 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 greatly disappointed and greatly hurt through some yeah. of those decisions that have been made. Yeah, um, Chair, for me, I'm sorry, Mark. Not, you feel free to add. I I think the reputational damage um, issue, yes, has has be, is acknowledged. I suppose. Um, both the Commission and the, the Chief Commissioner, in addition to her senior counsel uh, leading the um, review that she's commissioned, have been meeting with affected parties. I myself, uh, as, as, as I know you're aware from some of the correspondence, have met with some of the affected parties and indeed some MLAs have been facilitating um, those discussions. I'm really pleased that a number of the affected, and I'm using that term affected parties in the absence of something better, sorry, um, but you know, those who have been affected by negative you know, decisions. Um, I, I am really pleased to see that the, uh, a number of those parties have also engaged with the independent panel. And I suppose, Chair, there's no one answer. I suppose people, people yes, have been hurt. People have strong views about the, the proportionality issue. It's, it's one that the Minister's keen to, to get right. And restore that balance. Uh, I mean, yeah, being, being optimistic, I believe there's always, um, and there seems to be goodwill on both sides in terms of working through those issues. There's been a number of apologies, as you're pro I know the committee's aware, um, um, from the, the chief commissioner, the new chief commissioner as well. Um, so we're working through those issues, and I, I would be confident. I, I definitely would be confident about a, a resolution. Okay, look, thanks for that. Sharon, I have um, just, mm -hmm. if members want to ask questions, can I just ask them to raise their mm -hmm. hand? Um, at the moment, I have Alex and then I have Kelly. So can I then can ask uh, Spotlight to bring Alex in first? Alex, if you have a question. Yeah, um, no, I'm, I'm glad this is coming forward and, and I'm quite um, keen to get my tooth into this. So thank you for your presentation. <laughs> Um, well, not not into this specifically today, as such, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. when it comes to the committee, and openness and transparency are, are extremely important. So I'm mm -hmm. looking forward to that from the minister. Um, just one question: in terms of current court cases that are ongoing, and I think of the one for Victoria Housing and Chains. Mm -hmm which um, the Charity Commission had taken forward. Will any of this, in terms of the bill, have an impact on the likes of those, those cases? you think? Uh, no, or not? If I could no. answer that, um, as, as Sharon has said, um, any proposed bill will have clear um, uh, provision in it to protect uh, ECHR rights for individuals, mm -hmm. so nothing that is proposed in the bill would um, stop anyone uh, who is currently in the process of litigation or, in fact, proposed litigation from going forward with that. 
Okay. Um, now, you, you can call me stupid if you want, but I, I'm talking about cases that the Charity Commission are, have taken people to court because they're investigating their charities. Those court cases will, will continue um, to their natural conclusion. Uh, okay. There's nothing in our proposed bill that would call a halt to those. Okay, that's, that's all I need to do. Hello, uh, Mr Easton, what, 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 I, what I would just add is there are issues for the Commission itself in terms of... Um, I, I'm sorry, there's feedback. There's really serious feedback. So, um, issues for the Commission in terms of its strategy around where law, the, the, the feedback's gone, that's great. Whatever somebody has done, that's working better. Um, so, issues for the Commission itself around, um, you know, a strategy for where previous um, orders and decisions were unlawful, then they'd be unlikely at this stage to go forward and defending anything that's already ruled unlawful, but for anything that is in train at the minute. And if there's anything specific, we can pick it up with you offline. I should have said the Commission itself, you know, was keen at some stage to give evidence to the committee. So, you know, it's just something that's there as an offer as well. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, I'll move on then to Kelly and just remind members again if they want to ask any questions, they need to use their hands up function on their um, uh, their device. Go ahead, Kelly. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Sharon and Martin. Um, an important piece of work and I don't envy your timetable on that, um, but I'm looking more for assurances for the range of charities that are across Northern Ireland. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not a charity trustee now, but I worked in the community of voluntary sector before I became an MLA. Um, and at that time, I helped to assist a number of organisations to get their new charity registration through the Commission. Um, those charities jumped through a significant number of hoops and red tape. Um, I just would love to know um, the assurances that those charities are not going to have to be faced with so much paperwork again. Um, and also mm -hmm. that... The registration, as you have said, the registration is a separate thing, but that that registration, is there an assurance for those charities who have been through the process mm -hmm. and have come out the other end, that they won't be prevented from being able to apply for funding? For instance, earlier on today, um, we heard about the UK Community Renewal Fund and mm -hmm. the Shared Prosperity Fund, and that may well involve a direct application through to Westminster. Um, mm -hmm. Are our charity registrations here going to be considered as legal and lawful. Um, so that's my first, mm -hmm. first set of questions, just on those assurances. We can give you very strong assurances on that. Martin, do you want to? Well, the, the, the proposed bill um, mm -hmm. would make uh, previous, uh, uh, the, the register that has been uh, found to be unlawful, it would make it lawful. Mm -hmm. um, Otherwise, without that amendment, mm -hmm. charities would be required to apply again for registration. Mm -hmm. um, but it's clear that, that the bill, one of, one of the central aims of it is to make that register lawful. The vast majority of those registration mm -hmm. decisions were uncontroversial and were welcomed by charities. Okay. Um, with regard to applications for funding, I am aware that the Commission wrote to funders explaining the situation um, uh, that, that the fact that the registration um, was invalid was no fault of the charity themselves mm -hmm. and asking them to take that into account when applications for funding were made. Yeah, and even in advance of the decision, my understanding is because we had a backlog of charities not registered here, funders have always taken that that approach. Um, you know that you're waiting to be registered, and then that with the commission providing the clarity to funders. Um, I don't think there's any risk there at all, and we're not aware of anybody who's been financially impacted adversely, financially impacted. That's good to hear, um, okay. because it yeah. was one of the things that, um, if I was still working in the community and voluntary sector, I would need to sort of have that in writing, because it could have significant impact. Um, one of the other things I wanted to ask you about is, obviously, the as you have said, there was a number of 
applications have gone through without any issues. A lot of paperwork, um, a lot of time spent by organisations on those and they come out the other side. But there are other decisions that were taken within the Charity Commission, um, for instance, on use of data, which is a, a different mm -hmm. aspect to the registration of charities. Um, is, there, is the independent panel reviewing how decision making was taken across any of, of the aspects of, of the Commission? Um, is that being considered in any way? Because there was some queries over the use of data and how decisions were taken by staff. And I'm aware of sharing of data issues, Martin. Do you, you're you closer to that? Um, I think the, the review is, is looking at all, all the processes and, mm -hmm. and uh, how the Commission um, made decisions. Um, so uh, all, all of those types of decisions, um, casework decisions, etc., would fall within the scope of that. Um, the, the, I mean, as Sharon has said, the, the, the main purpose of the review is to look at how CCNI delivered its statutory functions up to now, how it will be delivered in the future to ensure the best service for um, charities and their beneficiaries. That's, pretty, that's good to hear. Um, very comprehensive. My goodness, it's a lot of work. Uh, my final question then, just asking about the, the legislation, um, Martin, that you'd be bringing mm -hmm. forward. Um, obviously, we don't want to have to have bodies going, being taken to court and, and having to go through that court process. Is there any consideration within the legislation coming forward about who can hold um, the Commission to account? Is it being brought in within the Ombudsman or anybody else um, to, to try and sort of give another option rather than court? Uh, not, not in our proposed bill. Our proposed okay. bill simply looks at making uh, previous decisions lawful with DCHR protections. Um, for any decision made lawful, there will be fresh appeal rights. Um, there's also, it's all, it also looks at delegation going forward and then the the power to make a registration threshold. Um, there, there's it, it is simply that at this stage. Yeah. So but it may, maybe important um, to just to note, and this this might give you some comfort on this is in the terms of reference. And I know that Una Breen and her team is coming to see you as a committee. But in the terms of reference, we have an explicit line. If you remember, Martin, around to look at things short of going to tribunal, what are the, what are the ways of holding people to account other, short of tribunal? So, so we have that couple of sentences in there in the terms of reference, and I'll reissue it after this session so that you see it. I'll, I'll highlight it, because I, yep. I think that is important to proportionality. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, exactly. It's 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 instead of yeah. going for you know yeah. running a hundred miles an hour straight yeah. to court, if there's mm -hmm. like an appeals process that's robust mm -hmm. enough that that means mm -hmm. that the commission can look at itself mm -hmm. and also deal with that balance. No, that mm -hmm. that's very good. A lot of work, guys. Thank you very much. I know that when the charity commission for Northern Ireland was set up, I I way back in the dark ages, I was part of um, teams of organisations that that discussed how it could go forward and. Mm -hmm. You know, the application process was always going to be complex and, mm -hmm. and complicated. Um, there are an, an enormous number of charities out there who went through that process and have come out the other side, have had their registration up until the court case, um, mm -hmm. and happy enough with that. Uh, there have been other cases where it just something has gone wrong and they're being dealt with but um, mm -hmm. it's a lot of work and thank you very much for it as, as the chair has said um, there's a lot coming through from our minister um, we look forward mm -hmm. to seeing work as soon as possible hopefully it'll not take as long as the liquor licensing but <laughs> <laughs> we hope so too <laughs> yeah, I think we all hope that so we do. Any, um, any other member wish to ask questions Andy yeah, sure. A um, couple of points, um, and I echo members' comments around the concerns and the wider uh, reputational impact there has, and there's been a number of genuine concerns raised. Um, just, just one point, Sharon, can I pick up um, with yourself? Um, mm -hmm. You'd mentioned reporting, charity reporting. Did, did you say that's on a voluntary basis at the moment? So it's um, obviously when the registration, the register fell, mm -hmm. um, Obviously, the duty to report into the Commission fell with it. So anybody who's reporting in at the minute is reporting on a voluntary basis. But we're really heartened by the fact that 64% at least of charities who legally actually now don't need to be reporting in are reporting in. And that's, I suppose that's important for public assurance around charitable giving, uh, you know, here. So we're happy 
that that's happening, and it's as a result of um, NICFA and the Commission, you know, telling people that you know you're still a charity legally, but you don't have to report. Although we, we would encourage you to do so on a on a on a voluntary basis. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm, it's important that charities continue to report, uh, and, and it's, yes. it's good to see that, that that's continuing. Can I ask then, where does that leave then um, decisions whereby an organisation had not reported in time with their, their sort of uh, mandatory timeline as uh, detailed with their year end, uh, and they were placed in default? Where, yeah. where, where does that leave those? I'm assuming that there is no such thing as default, Martin. Are you? Because obviously. <laughs> There, there is, so, uh, that, so that, if an organisation uh, doesn't register in time mm. on the Charity Commission's website, their account would be marked as uh, in default in terms of having submitted those reports on time. Now, albeit just, that uh, with coronavirus mm. at the moment, that the, yeah. there is an exception, but that will there have was. been occurring previously. So there was. Where does, where does and then, of happen? course, the, there, there will have been charities registered legally through the statutory one, Schedule 1 committees. Um, uh, you know, who would have to report, Martin, can you... Can you shed any light? My, my understanding is that uh, when the register was found to be unlawful, the Charity mm -hmm. Commission um, removed those flags, but mm -hmm. I can check up on that and come back to you on that. Mm -hmm. so, so at the moment, those organisations that are reporting uh, voluntarily uh, will not mm -hmm. be placed in default? No, if they don't no, because it's entirely, no, because it's entirely voluntary. But, but at the moment, the Commission are stating uh, in line with their, their guidance on their coronavirus regulations that no organisation will be submitted or uh, marked as in default, um, as a, obviously on their coronavirus. So there clearly is okay. that intention to mark them as def on their default, uh, taking away coronavirus. So maybe something that needs to be looked at. Yeah, I'm thinking, Martin, that that might be, and we can go away, certainly, of course we will, and, and check that. But, but obviously there are charities who have been registered since the judgments, mm -hmm. But through the Schedule One committees, and they would be yeah. legally registered, therefore would be required, Martin, is my assumption. Yes. So yes. that's probably what that is, and Mr. Allen. But we will go away and we will write to you to, to clarify. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just further convolute the situation. Um, <laughs> Can, can I ask, so, so also you had mentioned uh, as a consequence of the determination um, and the position that we currently find ourselves in, there is a greater cost uh, to the Commission in terms of their, their wider decision making. Is there any figures on that? Um, I don't have those figures to hand, but we can get those for you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and also can I ask then as well, have the Department of the Commission been made aware of any concerns uh, from organisations regarding the, the wider registration process? As Kelly pointed out, um, you know, and I have some experience of this myself, there, there was a lot mm -hmm. of um, information that had to be provided to the Commission in, in that respect. But mm -hmm. are, are they, the Department aware of any concerns with that wider registration process? Yes, that's come forward very, very clearly um, in the, um, well, the, the, the minister herself had been lobbied and, and, and heard from a number of, of sort of grassroots and small charities. And it's, it's the reason, Mr. Allen, that has, I suppose, taken us into obviously that area of um, a threshold or de minimis. Uh, below which smaller charities may not have to register. But the issue might not be having to register. It might be the fact that the, the process is much too bureaucratic. And I know the independent panel is very keen to talk to you about what they're hearing about that specific issue. Martin, anything else from your... You know, it's it's been raised with us repeatedly. You know. Uh -huh. Yes. You no. Know, I, I just mm -hmm. I know that that's mm -hmm. a that's a clear focus of mm -hmm. the independent uh, yeah. review, and that they have been conducting a number of webinars and evidence sessions, and, mm -hmm. and that has come through clearly to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, can I can I also ask then the the wider threshold issue was that not something that was considered previously? Is is that it would be? It's been conveyed to me that this was clearly. Oh. Uh, Intimated to the department at the time of taking forward uh, char charity legislation and regulation, um, that this should have been given consideration back then. W was that the case? My, under my understanding mm -hmm. is that um, the, when the Assembly passed the Charities Act in 2008, they were very clear that they wanted a level playing field and that all charities, uh, regardless of income or assets, would be registered. Um, and there were to be no exceptions. That is the case in Ireland, Scotland, um, although there is a registration threshold in England and Wales, um, but the other jurisdictions don't have one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. so, so that all organisations are, are required to register in Northern Ireland, and that was the clear policy mm -hmm. intent. 
Yeah. It's very low registration threshold in England and Wales, isn't it? About 5,000, Martin, yes. 5,000. Yeah. Um, whereas, uh, and again, I'm sure the panel will tell you that the, the position paper from the charity sector as, as put to us through NICFA was suggesting somewhere in the region of 20,000. So just to give you that information, I mean, obviously the, the panel will have heard a lot more evidence than we have, but the position paper from NICFA was in and around 20,000 that was being proposed. I know it's it's not what we expected, but that's the NICFA canvassed its members. But again, as I say, what we're hearing from the panel webinars is that it might be more an issue of the bureaucracy around the process. And if you removed a lot of that, then having no threshold would give you visibility of all charities you know, registered here. So it's, it's a balance, which is why the minister's keen to take the power and then act on the evidence uh, as it comes forward. You know, um, and that would be through subordinate legislation if she was doing that, which would be affirmative in terms of um, would have to be scrutinised, debated on and voted on, you know, if, if it did happen. OK, and, and just also then in terms of uh, previous mm -hmm. decisions around orders, statutory inquiries, have they all, mm -hmm. are they all being reviewed as part of the wider process um, by the Commission, sorry? Mm -hmm. Uh, as I say, I think the independent review is is looking at all the processes and how the commission functions. Um, mm -hmm. So, so, so all all those processes would be included, I believe. But not the substance of them. So not not no. not the decisions themselves, but how it's it's yeah. it's the how. I think yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, and can can I ask as well? Um, you might not have this to hand. Just the mm -hmm. the staffing and resource of the commission is the department satisfied mm -hmm. that the the commission have uh, adequate and sufficient staffing and resources to to fulfil their duties. Uh, being honest, Mr. Allen, because because of obviously the um, impact of the judgments and. Um, the fact that the, the, there are, you know, a number of committees that weren't there before and there's costs that we will bring to you, you know, as you've asked for earlier around um, around the cost of those those committees. Um, part of the reason why we're having the review and the minister's looking at the review is how, we, we need to look at how it will, if, it will operate effectively going forward. So it, it wouldn't be fair and I, I couldn't give you a strong assurance at the minute that we believe that the commission is resourced um, properly, or, you know, there wouldn't be a backlog. There wouldn't be a backlog of um, um, registration decisions even before these judgments. So um, it, it's something that's it's being considered as part of the review. Yeah. Okay, and I suppose yeah. my last question, and I know uh, all mm -hmm. this stems from a misinterpretation of the legislation, but how do we get it so wrong? <laughs> Well, it was it was a, a a technical point in law, and there were mm -hmm. arguments to be made, and uh, the, the 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 McBride judgment upheld the counter view to that of the commission and the department, and we accept that. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was sure. scrutinised to go through the assembly at the time. I suppose you know it, it did go through all of the scrutiny that. That assembly bills, uh, you know, should go through, and as Martin said, um, the Attorney General ha had had a clear view, um, and and we have reflected. I mean, the current Attorney General has given a view too that if she had looked at and and you know she too could see the flaws. Um, so yeah, so, is, probably is, a lot of lessons learned. Were there no concerns raised with with the flaws back at the time that, that have been identified now? Um, were there, Martin? I know, I know. Uh, you know, you have there, to look there, back. There, there was a, there, there was an issue raised in two thousand and eleven, um, but the, the, the department's advice was Legal that advice. they they could rely on the provisions within the Act and the Interpretation Act. Take um, it together, yeah. Be, because of the the uniqueness of the section nineteen of the Northern Ireland Interpretation Act. That that um, that proved to be wrong, um, and McBride found against that, and that was upheld in the Court of Appeal. And mm -hmm. uh, as, it's, as I say, the department accepts that. Okay, and, and yeah. you say there were previous concerns raised at the time. Can can we get that the information on that? Whatever concerns were raised at the time, I'm sure the department would have those, would they? Uh, yes, I'm sure we can provide that. Okay. Um, 
Uh, just, just in finishing, I probably could go on as, uh, a few other points. Um, I'm looking forward to meeting with the, the, the independent panel, uh, but I'm sure you'll both agree and, and the department will agree we have a long way to go on this to repair the reputational damage, even if we can repair it, because understandably mm -hmm. are, there are a lot of people who are um, significantly aggrieved uh, with, with the wider process. I think I think Mr. Allen, yeah, I mean in, in ending my, my presentation I spoke about, you know, the Minister's desire to to restore that public confidence and trust. Um and and, and she is a rights based minister. Uh she she takes those concerns seriously, which is why she has obviously established and and there if there's a bill, there's the independent review and then there's the assurances from the Chief Commissioner that lessons have been learned around how um, uh, those um, statutory inquiries in particular um, uh, were conducted and, and what lessons we can read into going forward. So taking together all of those things, I, I, I accept we have a, a way to go, um, but you know, with the commitment of all, all parties, and I think believe we have the commitment of the Commission, Obviously, a very strong commitment from the minister, and um, there's a reasonableness on on the part of the party, certainly that I have spoken to and met with. Okay. I think we can. Yeah. yeah just mm -hmm. one 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 further point, um, and and mm -hmm. it is absolutely important that we learn the lessons from this and moving forward. But uh, will the department give consideration to a robust accountability mechanism in respect to this? Um, you know, we need to learn the lessons, but also we need accountability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think whenever the um, the panel speaks to the independent panel in terms of their terms of reference, there's the accountability mechanisms we spoke about in terms of decisions of the commission and you know and and rights you know to you know powers beyond going or sorry between. Uh, decisions and a tribunal um, and all, all that happens in between. But also, I think the department, and I think one of the things we wanted to make clear today is that the department has lessons to learn as well in terms of our role in holding everybody to account in terms of that regulatory framework. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. And, and just, just mm -hmm. uh, for that point, um, I think it's important, Chair, um, and obviously I'll be a decision for the committee to take, that we, we do hear from the Commission as well as, as soon as possible. Um, and we're hearing from the panel at the end of the month, but also the Commission, Chair. OK, thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, uh, thank you, Sharon, and thank you, Martin. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've, you've, you've got a sense here from the committee that we are keen um, yeah. to get this in front of us. Um, and, yeah. and to do the right thing, I think that's that's what we very much there's a sense of amongst the committee mm -hmm. members, and I know there's a sense of that with the minister and the department as well. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank, thank you, Andy. members. Bye, bye, bye. Okay, members, I think Andy made a good point there, um, and I think that is something that we will um, certainly take that proposal forward as well. Members, that's us. Hope we've come to the end of our meeting today. Um, so we have, which is a, a shock. I don't think we've ever had a meeting that has finished at this time. Um, uh, so I'll just remind members, as of agenda item 11 again, that the date, time and location of our next meeting um, is uh, next Tuesday, the 11th of May at 9.15am in room 30, followed by a second meeting next uh, Thursday, the 13th of May in, at 9.15 in room 29. So thank you, members. Thank you. The Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room.